How great is our God. It says all will see how great he is. All will see how great he is through his creation, through his people, through his promise, through the works that he has done, his greatness will be displayed. And we're gathering today because greatness has been displayed and we have put our faith in him, we have trusted in him, if indeed we have. I don't know who's sitting out here today, I don't know where you're coming from, but I pray that God works in every one of our lives. To his glory, by his power, he says he wants to do incredible things through us who say yes to him. And so we are here trusting in him. I want to give a big shout out. That's the phrase today, the shout out. <laughs> to all the people who are sitting back in the overflow room to this, this morning leaving room for, for our guests and, and everybody to come in and have a seat. We appreciate you guys sitting back there. Thank you. Um, we are here to celebrate. Every week we're here to celebrate the fact that God has loved us. The fact that God has given to us, he has considered us. You look at the scope of this universe and it's so tempting, so tempting, it's so quick to ask, just like David did, who are we? that God would even consider us. We just exist on a speck of a speck of a speck of dust in the scope of this universe. And yet, that God would acknowledge us and he would die for us, that he would pay the price for our sin with his life is just amazing. And so we come each week to learn from him, to read through his word, to find out who he is so we can live according to his power instead of our own. Last week we talked about Palm Sunday. It was Palm Sunday last week when 2,000 years ago as Jesus rode into Jerusalem in that last entry, that last week of his life. And the people were so excited that here was salvation and they shouted, Hosanna to the King. They shouted that in the face of the Roman armies that were watching them. They shouted that as a, a voice of treason. It was a frightening, scary thing to say, and yet nobody could keep them quiet. And yet, by the end of the week, they had turned. By the end of the week, instead of shouting Hosanna to the king, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Because their, mets, their needs were not met, their ideas were not met, their expectations were not met and we learn a lot of times we have expectations of what God should do what God's supposed to do and when our expectations aren't met we're discouraged and it leaves us wondering well where is God if God is and if God loves why does he do it this way why doesn't he take care of that why doesn't he fix this how did he let that happen and all these questions come to our minds when we have these selfish expectations of who God is supposed to be instead of looking deeply into who he really is. The people were unwilling to change what was already in their mind. Somebody had told them, here's what Messiah is. Here's what's going to happen. And when it didn't happen that way, they were discouraged. And they called for his crucifixion. We don't want to be that way, do we? We want to be the people who are willing to learn, willing to find out something that we didn't know before, to see something about Jesus, something about God that's brand new. What we're talking about today is not brand new. And yet, how often do you take something that's really, really good and because you're comfortable with it, because you're familiar with it, you miss the power of it? I don't know how it happens, but I've heard airplane pilots talk about it's just a job. I don't know. I don't think I could ever get just a job tired of flying airplanes. I think that'd just be such a neat thing to do. But some people, they get, they just, it becomes so comfortable to them, they forget what happens. 
They forget the grandeur of it. They miss the beauty of being able to see so much of the world. It's a beautiful thing. We don't want to miss the beauty of what God has done. So we're here to remember what God has done for us. This last Friday was Good Friday. It's Good Friday and it's Bad Friday. It's the worst and it's the best. It's the worst because it's the day that Jesus died. It's the worst because it's the day that Jesus was arrested, he was beaten, he was nailed to a cross. But it was Good Friday because that's the day that he defeated all the powers of Satan and gave us hope. So we celebrate that day and today is, is a wonderful day because today is the day that God put his stamp on his identity of Jesus. He said he was not just another guy. He was not just another figure spouting lessons that somebody ought to follow. He was not somebody who was just trying to make a name for himself. He actually was God, God's son, God in the flesh. God come here to pay the price for our sin that we couldn't. He was not just some miracle worker, some magician, he was in fact God because there is an empty grave over there now. And we have hope because that's not just the first time that's going to happen. It is the first time, but not the last. So we want to talk about, about that day. But there's another day. There's another special, something special about today. It is April 1st. It is April Fool's Day. And I, this is one of my favorite days when April Fool's falls on a Sunday morning. Because it was April 1st, 2001. This building was not built. We were meeting in the school building down the street here. And we got there early to set up and the doors were locked. It was kind of a rainy, misty morning, cool. And we called the people supposed to have the door, the, the keys from the school people. And they said, well, you know, they're out of town. We'll contact somebody else. And then they were out of town and they called somebody else. We were calling all these people and nobody had a key to let us into that building. So we're standing on the sidewalk. And we're thinking, well, what do we do now? It's Easter, or it wasn't Easter, but it was, it was April 1st. It was Sunday. We're here for church. This building was halfway built. There's no wood over there. It's just sticks. There was a big pile of lumber here. There was a forklift sitting right here. Big forklift. There was a little bit of space over here. And we all just walked down the street. You remember that? We walked down the street and we came in. We had our first worship service huddled around the forklift. There was some sheeting, some plywood on this side of the building. And I, and I just remember that day as we, we huddled in here and we gave praise to God. And we thanked him for his presence, for his sacrifice. And it was a special day. Who was there with us that day? There was a few of us there. They're still here. It seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? And yet every April 1st, I think about that. It's like Satan wanted to fool us and say, ah, ha, 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 ha. And yet, it was one of the most precious times that I remember us gathering together, singing around the forklift, and observing the Lord's Supper together, remembering Jesus. It was a good day. There was a day when all the powers of hell were fooled. There was a day when God did something that was so amazing, it caught all the rulers of heaven and, not so much heaven, but hell and this world off guard. They didn't know what was going to happen. They could not imagine what was going to happen. The Bible says that prophets looked, longed to look into what God was going to do about sin in the world. And it said the angels even longed to look to see what God was going to do about sin in the world because there was no way for it to work. They could not imagine. And yet God came up with this plan that fooled them all. And they were amazed. And we are amazed. So let's share.
together this story that God, this great work that he did. Paul writes in Colossians, chapter 2, he says, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. All that words, those words sound funny. They don't, it's not the type of words we use every day. Dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our flesh. What in the world do those things mean? But what he means is that we failed to reach the perfection of God. And so our eternity with God was a non-starter. It wasn't going to happen. We would die and we'd be forever separated from God. So we were separated from the life. We were dead in our sins. And that is the same way today. There is nothing we can do. God demire, uh, demands perfection. Matthew, on the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, he says, you be perfect as your Father is perfect. And none of us can do that. So he does it for us. But we were dead in that condition. He goes on, he says, he forgave all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. What did he nail to the cross? Our legal indebtedness. This is a term that we, we just kind of read over sometimes really fast. And we don't understand what it means. He took our sin away. <clears throat> Well, what he did is he really took away the indebtedness. You see, when I, I would never do this, but if I ever got stopped for speeding and they gave me a ticket, I would have incurred a legal indebtedness. I have a fine to pay for my infraction. And you know what happens if you don't pay that fine? You get a bigger fine and a bigger fine. And pretty soon they put you, in, well, I don't know if they put you in jail today, but they might, they could. Because I have broken the rule and somehow that debt has to be paid. And if I don't have the money to pay that debt, the court doesn't really care. Say, so here's the law. You gotta pay the debt. You made the mistake, you did the, you did the speed, you pay the price. The same situation is with us. Paul says that the wages of sin is death. When we sin, the legal indebtedness that we incur is death. It separates us from God who is our life. When God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he said, when you eat that fruit, you that one tree that I set apart and forbid you to eat it, if you eat it on that day, you will die. We know they didn't die. They went ahead and lived for many years. They had Cain and Abel who killed each other and all the things that happened there. We know they didn't die. So what did he mean? On that day, you incurred a legal indebtedness. And the price to pay that off is death. The price is life for sin. And every one of us have incurred that legal indebtedness. But he says here, he says, Christ forgave our sins, canceling, canceling the charge of our legal indebtedness. Suddenly somebody steps in and pays the price for us. They step in and say, I realize you don't have the money to pay for this fine, I will pay it for you. And the price is life. Life has to be given for this. And so Jesus says, I will pay with my life. My life is a perfect life. My life is a life without sin. I will give my life so your life can be restored. That relationship with God can be put back together. That legal indebtedness can be taken away and your ledger sheet is clean. Your sin is taken away. Nobody can come back to you and charge you because I've taken your debt away. That is a beautiful picture. That is the gift of God. But he goes on. He says he did this and he disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public 
spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Michael read that passage for us today out of Matthew. And I love this picture. The angel rolls the stone away from the grave and then sits on it. Can you see that? He just sits on it. They've got this Roman guard here guarding this tomb. And here's the angel. And I don't know, he just crosses, folds his arms and crosses his legs and sat there. So what do you think of that? I love the picture of this angel just sitting there. And these guys are so scared. Who is this guy? He's shining bright like lightning. And he's just sitting there looking at us. They were so scared. They were like dead men. They couldn't do a thing. They were paralyzed. But he didn't just scare the guards. God says he disarmed the powers and the authorities. All the powers of hell, all the authorities, the demons that Paul talks about in his letters, all the spirit world that would love to come and, and destroy us. Jesus himself said Satan's only purpose here is to steal to kill and destroy. He hates God and he hates everything that God loves, which means he hates you. And if he can kill, if he can steal, if he can destroy, if he can twist your life into a mess, it gives him great joy. But he says here that Jesus disarmed those authorities. He disarmed those powers and he made a public spectacle of them when he triumphed them over on the cross. The cross and triumph are not two words that should go together. The cross was an, it was an execution. It was, a, it was an electric chair, a gas chamber, a firing squad. It was some way to kill the, the criminals. But God says, no, it was triumph. Because nobody knew how God was going to take care of sin. And nobody could imagine that God would offer himself to pay the price. But when Jesus died on the cross, the price was paid, the life was given, and our slates were wiped clean. And Satan no longer had the power of hell behind him. He no longer had the power of death behind him. The ability for Satan to trap us in our sin was taken away because God came with a greater promise, a greater covenant. And he sealed it with his blood. And he said, this is a new promise. I will pay the price for your sin. You will be made pure and blameless in my sight because I have cleaned your ledger. I've taken all the indebtedness away. You don't owe a penny. What a gift. Peter wrote this. He said, concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke for the grace that was come to you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Peter's just saying, the prophets that wrote all these years, wrote all these, these prophecies, they didn't understand either what was going on. But they were trying to. They tried to search intently. What is God going to do? How can he take sin away? Because they knew full well in all their sacrifices, all the lambs, all the bulls, all the oxen, all the cows that were slaughtered for the sake of their sin, they knew that that was just temporary. That wasn't real. How could the blood of a goat take away your sin? It can't. And they knew that. It was a symbol of what God was going to do, but they were trying to figure out, what is he going to do? And so they looked into this. It was revealed to these people, to them, that they were not serving themselves, but rather you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And he says, even angels long to look into these things. They didn't know. Even the angels didn't know how God was going to do this until God put a Jesus on the cross. And kind of said, April Fool. 
You thought you had it all wired. You thought that I couldn't do this. You thought it would never happen. But look what I've done. I have triumphed over you through the least likely avenue of coming here, humbling myself, becoming flesh, and being crucified and paying the price for your indebtedness. You like it when somebody steps up and buys you a coffee at Starbucks? Whew, that's cool. Thank you. You like it when somebody steps in, pays your fines at court, and just all of your court fees are gone? You like when somebody pays the price for your sin and says, your hope for eternity is now secure. Not because you're so good, because I know you're not. But because God is so good. Jesus hung on that cross and he said, it's finished. We see that. We see that situation. John writes about it. He says, knowing, later, knowing that everything had now been finished. And so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, he's hanging on the cross at this time. He said, I'm thirsty. So a jar of wine vinegar was there and they soaked a sponge in it and they put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and they lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when Jesus had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. See, the work that God did was finished at that time. When Jesus gave his life, he paid the price for our indebtedness. And he made us pure. Our sin at that time, when we put our faith in him, was taken away. The resurrection is different from the fulfilling of the promise. The work was done on the cross. Death could no longer hold power over any of us. The sin was taken away. Matthew writes, Jesus records, records Jesus saying, he said, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder the house. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, the strong man was bound. He no longer had the power he had. He no longer had the power of death. He could no longer hold us in his grip. Satan had lost all his power. Jesus triumphed over him in the cross and giving his life. And Satan said, oops, didn't see that coming. Didn't understand that God would actually go to that length. Satan lost the power of sin and death. Jesus says, Jesus, Paul said, our struggle is not against sin. It's not against flesh. It's against the spiritual forces of this world that Satan is fighting against us but we don't have to lose Jesus fought that battle for us but it's amazing God has given us such a great gift and yet people will go to great extremes to avoid it they'll go to great extremes to avoid the gift that God gives us they'll deny it they'll say that didn't happen that couldn't have happened. That didn't happen. You're, you're silly for believing that. Yeah, maybe there's this Jesus guy, but die for our sins? I don't think so. Raised from the dead? No. Couldn't happen. There are theologians who say couldn't happen. It's amazing to me that they miss this. But the fact of the resurrection is that stamp that says it's true. It's not just a story. There were Roman guards there stationed under the threat of death that they should let anything happen to that tomb. And they failed miserably because that angel sat on that stone. And they were so scared, they became like dead men. There is an empty tomb over in Jerusalem that should be filled with the body of a Messiah. But it's not. So people deny it. People ignore it. They try to just go through life and don't even think about the fact that this life is going to end. They avoid the truth of death. They avoid the truth of sinfulness. They avoid the truth of eternity. They avoid it and they try to get just busy with life. And we do this. We get tied up in so many things today that we, are don't, we don't remember the more. <laughs> 
came and talked this morning, we don't remember the most important things. Jesus said it this way. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet what? Lose his own soul. Jesus says, you were made in the image of God to live forever. Think about this for a moment. We don't have that choice. We have been made in his image. That means a lot of things. But one of the things it means is we have eternity in our hearts. Eternity is set in us. We exist forever. But God gives us a choice. You can exist with me or without me. You can exist in a place where I am in control. The one who loves you enough to die for you the one who loves you enough to adopt you and make you his child, the one who loves you so much he would pay this awesome price for you, or you can live apart from me where I don't exist at all. And we'll just think with me for a minute. In this world, God exists around us. His presence of good is all around us. Jesus says that God causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. We all get the blessing of God's presence. Can you imagine a place where God's presence is not there and none of his blessings follow? In this world where God's presence is all around us and we all experience the goodness of his blessings, do you realize how evil people can get? Do you realize how dark people's hearts are and the, the horrors that people meet out on each other? And that's in a place where God exists. What would it be like in a place where God doesn't exist? I don't know, to me that, that sounds kind of like weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sounds like a place where you would be burning whether there is literal fire in hell or not, I don't know. But any place where God is not existent would be a place akin to burning in a fire forever. I, I, I did. But he says, here's the truth. This world is not our home. There is eternity set in your hearts. But you have these few years, these few moments in this life, which is just like a vapor. It's here and it's gone. Do you have these few moments to make a choice? Do you want to live at God's side or apart? But we get busy with our lives and we don't even think about it. We ignore it. We avoid it. Those questions. We try to escape it sometimes through all kinds of other means and, and so forth. But Jesus says, wait a minute. This world is not your home. There is more coming. And he is the firstborn, Paul says, from the dead. This is important to us. Paul writes, he says, What I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried and he was, what? Raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man. This idea of first fruits is important to us as Christians. The farmer experiences the first fruits at his first harvest. And it's a, it's a promise of what's going to come. He plants his seed, the seed grows up, and you get the first fruits. A lot of times a business, you'll see their first dollar framed and hanging on the wall there in the, in the, whatever, in the store. That was the first fruits. That was a, the first dollar with the expectation that more will follow. It was just the first one. Jesus was the first fruits from the grave with the promise that more will follow. All of us will follow in his steps. We are not made for this world. We're made for something far greater. He says, 
For as I was... Which one does that say? I can't read it from here. For as an animal, okay. <laughs> he says, here's, here's the deal. As in Adam, the first man in this world, when he sinned, all die. But so in Christ, all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him, those who have made the choice in this life, to walk with him, those who put their trust in him. And then he says, when the perishable then has been clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in what? Victory. Jesus triumphed over the powers of Satan on the cross. He gave us victory. So he says, where, O oh death? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. Because sin separates us from God. But if there's no sin, if the law has been taken away from us, if our legal indebtedness has been paid, we have broken the law, but God came in and paid the price for us, if that is the case, then the sting of death doesn't exist. We've been given a gift. And my prayer is that we don't forget we don't get busy and ignore it. We don't get sidetracked in all the other things of life and forget what's happened. The Easter doesn't become a day of just bunnies and Easter eggs. But it is a resurrection day that we celebrate every day of our life because God has done something for us. And so Paul says this, after reminding us that God is the first fruits and he has secured victory for us, he says this, therefore my dear, my dear brothers and sisters, I love Paul's language here. My dear brothers and sisters, because of this, because of what God's done, stand firm. Don't waver. Make a choice and stick with it. He says, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully. Give yourselves how? What does that mean in your life? Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. It doesn't mean to, to sequester yourself in, an, in a, mon a monastery <laughs> someplace or a convent. It means to completely it's turn over your will. I surrender myself. I die to myself. I deny myself so I can live for you. I submit myself fully into the Lordship of Christ because I can trust him. Because look what he's done. He paid the price for my sin, for my fees, for my fines, for my indebtedness. He paid that price when he didn't have to. He paid it at great cost to him because it required life. And he had to surrender his life for my sake. And I know that he's true and he's trustworthy because there's an empty grave in Jerusalem. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my goodness. So because of that gift, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That everything we do for God's glory, for his behalf, every surrender we make, every firm stand we take for him, it is not in vain. He is building a house for us. He told his disciples, when his disciples were so scared, so wondering what's going to happen, Jesus is talking death and dying and leaving us alone. And Jesus says, no, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm going to fix something for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Trust me in this. This is not just pie in the sky by and by. This is real. I'm going to make a place for you so that you can be where I am. And I'm going to come back and get you. I'll return. We had a song for our children when they were very little. It says, Mommy always comes back. We say, Mommy always comes back. Mommy always comes back. Reminding them of what's true. We won't leave them alone. And that's exactly what Jesus said to us. I'm going to build a place for you, but I'm coming back. 
So stand firm. So church, this is the message he gives to us. Stand firm. Don't ignore the truth. Don't get caught up in things so that get so busy that we don't even see the truth anymore. We get clouded and we get confused and we forget the truth. This life is short. I'm realizing that more every day. And then we have eternity to look forward to. Or eternity to fear. Because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The things you do doesn't go unnoticed by the Lord. Let's give him thanks. Father, if our labor was in vain, if we were just spinning our wheels here, it would be so discouraging. But you've told us, Father, that our work is productive. It means something. There's purpose to us. Help us to trust in that even when it seems unproductive. Father, we know that your word does not go out empty. It does not return empty. It goes out with power. Father, use us to be your light, to be your salt. Give us firm footing to stand on your promises, on the gift that you've given to us, that you have paid the price and you have guaranteed our home. And you're preparing a place for us even as we speak. Father, we trust in you. Bless us. Father, with clarity to never forget the truth. God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song. And it's a time for us to say, to think about our, our lives, our relationship with God. To think, you know, have I gotten so busy that I've forgotten what's really important in this life? Have I just felt like maybe I am spinning my wheels, that there is no purpose to what I'm doing? Are, have, we, have we gotten off track? And if we have, then we need to get back on. And our elders are standing in the back right now to sit down and pray with you to get back on track. To put him number one in our lives and to make a choice today while we have the chance to live with him instead of apart from him. He is not there to put a, a kill joy in our lives and to do, take away all the fun. He's there to give us real life. He says, I want you to have abundant life. In the, even in the face of the storm, I want you to know the joy of walking in the power of the Lord and the Spirit. And so our elders are standing there to, ready to take those prayers, those needs back to God, our source. But if you've never given your life to Christ in the first place, if you've never given yourself and accepted that gift, that salvation from our sin and that, that sinful indebtedness be taken away, if you've never done that, we're ready to help you do that today. What you do is you put your faith in Christ. You say, God, I can't do this on my own. I am in, incapable. I am a sinner, and I surrender myself to you in faith, believing that you do take away sin. And then we are baptized. We die to ourselves. We are buried in this baptism where Paul says we are buried into Christ. And then we are raised up to walk a whole new life, just like Jesus did. Read that in Romans 6. He said, that's why we do that. In order that we can walk like Jesus did. And if you're ready to give your life to Christ and do that today, we're ready to help you today. While we stand and while we sing this song.